Is that you down there? Yes, yeah, Sammy, that's -a me. What do you want? Heck of a time to go fishing, Jack. Our first show is starting in a couple of minutes. Oh, my God, I forgot. I forgot. I'm sorry. Look, you guys take off, and I'll join you later, all right? Any last-minute instructions? Yes, yeah, Sammy, just be yourself. Just be yourself, you and Elaine, and everything's going to work out beautifully. Go ahead. We'll see you later. Don't forget to change your clothes, honey. Oh, you don't like these? <laughs> all right, okay. Bye. We're going to visit Telly's Sporting Bar in Universal City. And then we're going to fly to Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, where we're going to meet a fascinating young man who almost became President of the United States. In Jack's Corner, we'll meet two great Americans that lived over 200 years ago. Sammy, tell them what we mean by on the road with. What we mean is this. As we travel from place to place, we're going to use beautiful old cars, antique horse-drawn buggies, and many other modes of transportation that you're going to love. Well, I think it's time for us to be off in our 1930 Bentley Roadster complete with leather exterior. Hang on to your seat. Hey, bartender. <laughs> Gee, Stelly, I didn't know it was you. Come down here and join us. Willie, uh, do you do this for a living, Telly? What's that, drink? <laughs> Hang around bars? Martin. We're really glad to see that the Kojak series is back on TV. It was certainly one of my favorites. And I'm sure Elaine. Mine too, mine uh, too. Is there anything different about the Kojak series this time? Yeah, I think what is going to be different is the fact that it's going to run two hours. It's going to be on once a month instead of every week. I think because of the time slot, two hours, we'll be doing shows which I feel can be more important and have something to say. I saw some paintings by Christina Savalas in the lobby of the hotel. That was your mother, wasn't it? Mama. Mama. She was great. You have an incredibly close family. Your relationship with your brothers, everything is wonderful. Thanks to Mom, who kept us together. You must be really proud of her. Those paintings are just beautifully done. Have they ever been shown in a gallery? She's had shows in different parts of the world. Haven't concentrated on America as much, although she's had exhibits out in Long Island. Some of her work is in the museum out there. I know your brother was telling me that they're in a museum in Libya and also in Greece. You ready for that? Oh, that, that's amazing. Amazing. You know, I would love to show the audience some of her paintings. Oh, would let's you, would do you like it, either. I love it. Right. Let me tell you about my mom, who taught us all at a very young age. Telly, bad or good, you gotta love the artist, all right? So that was Mama's axiom in life. She hung around artists all her life. Now, are you seeing these oh, perfectly? I, I think they're lovely. Am I holding them nice? This is from Mama. We just lost Mama about a year ago. You know, she came to visit me here at the hotel some 16 years ago and never went back. Never, went never back. left. So she just... lived here too, didn't she? Yeah. Well, I, could, I tell you, they're just simply lovely. I mean, I'm hoping the audience gets as clear as pictures we can see. And these are just the, these are pictures, the paintings. I hope so. Uh, the paintings are hanging, some paintings are hanging out here in the Universal. Um, yes, chair. they are lithographs. This is one of Mom's work. Any of these, beautiful. the children like you? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, mean, I come I from a my... long line of artists. Uh, you know, my uncle, you know, the cathedral here in... Los Angeles, all the paintings you see there were done by my uncle. And he painted all the churches uh, in America, all the Greek Orthodox churches. And grandfather before that uh, was an artist, and on and on and on. But you don't paint? I don't. What, don't. what type of artistic ability do you have other than um, do, being such a fabulous actor? Thank you, Sam. Spread that rumor. <laughs> I think I'm the only one in the family with no artistic bent. How many brothers and sisters do you have? Well, 
There's my brother Gus. He's the older one. He's a diplomat. Although he sings fabulously. And uh, there was my brother George, who we lost. There's my brother Teddy, who's a school teacher and a fine painter, incidentally. And there's my sister Catherine. That's all of us. You have two children that I saw the other night. Adorable, precious babies. A lot of children, honey. So you have a lot of children. <laughs> yeah, you... Well, you didn't have them all with you. <clears throat> but you saw two of them. Yes. And they are adorable and they are precious, yeah. Oh, Their right. names and ages? What age you want to start well, at? Yeah. Yeah. This, this, this is the younger one. Oh, the younger one is two. The older one is four. And then we go up the scale. All right? As high as you want to go. <laughs> no, no, that's not true. Yeah. Oh, gosh, we uh, are so happy that you came to be with us this afternoon. We have a little present yes, for you. Yes, we have you a surprise for you. And if, to if, uh, help you on your series. Gus, we, and we know you're going to love this. Yeah. Well, we hope. Oh, we hope. We hope. You <laughs> we hope you're going to love this, Kelly. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> my flavor, Sue. Well, you ready for that? Have a ball, will you? <laughs> I can suck for the rest of my life. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Elaine and I wish you the best of luck in, on your new series, and it's been our pleasure to be here at your beautiful... Uh, Telly sporting boy. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. You have everything you... under the sun in sports. I want here. another kid. <laughs> oh, I saw that in the movie once. I love it. I've been a farmer all my life. Born and raised on a small piece of property that we called a farm. Every inch of it covered with crops and animals. Uh, corn, potatoes, chickens. Uh, corn here is magnificent, so that when I, when I bought this large farm, I decided to raise an awful lot of corn. This way, it reminds me of Hollywood, uh, for obvious reasons. Farmers and actors have a lot in common, except that to be a successful farmer, you don't have to look like anything special. Whereas, to be a, a super stud actor, you've got to have the Hollywood panache and you've got to have the, uh, the profile, and what they've got to do for you is arrange these, these marvelous luncheons where you meet the press and the media and, uh, and, uh, and all the producers. In 1955, uh, I, was having a, I was having lunch at Warner Brothers restaurant in Burbank with, uh, with Gig Young, a well-known light comedy actor, and the already infamous James Dean, it was at that time working in a film called Rebel Without a Cause. The waitress gave us the menus and I ordered very quickly because the specialty of the day was corn, potatoes, and chicken. Gig ordered a rather complicated sandwich and a double martini. And then Dean. Dean, uh, uh, he crossed and uncrossed his legs about 12 times, played a little melody on his lips, and then he looked up at the ceiling for about three minutes, and finally he said, let me have one of them, their uh, hamburgers. I looked at, at Gig, and I thought he was going to have an apoplectic seizure, and he would have, except just at that moment, two lovely women came into the, into the restaurant and walked directly to our table. One of them was Jane Mansfield. Jane ordered a, a sandwich and a cup of coffee, and Pierre Angeli, who was a, a friend of Jimmy's at the time, she was on a diet, so she ordered some fruit. Anyway, we had lunch. Five people who were like strangers unto each other, as actors very often are, and four of whom, within a relatively brief period of time, were to die tragically. Two of them by their own hand. That was a l lunch to remember. And now, here I am in this cornfield about to have lunch again with Sammy and Elaine. Ah, uh, but there is a note that says, sorry, we can't join you for lunch, see you later. That's brief and to the point, isn't it? I wonder if they heard my little story. Well, here we are, lunch. Uh, would you like to join me? Hi. How are you? What's it to tell you? Uh, I'm from the Sammy and Elaine show, and I just wanted to know... Which one are you? What do you mean? I'm Sammy. Well, I'm sorry for you, and I'm sorry for her, too. See you around. That's a nice guy.
the Packer Mansion in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, was built by Asa Packer, a millionaire philanthropist in the 19th century. Because Asa had barely lost in his bid for the United States presidency, Sammy and Elaine wanted to meet him and his wife, Sarah. They used their bag of magic and entered the house of Packer. Good evening. Won't you come in? Mr. Packer is in the dining room, and Mrs. Packer is about to join him. May I take your bag? When the Bailey, Banks, and Biddle American Gothic clock struck seven, Elaine became Mrs. Asa Packer, descending the beautiful English post oak staircase to the entry hall and into the dining room, where her husband was already enjoying his dinner and his artifacts, most especially the chandelier. He particularly loved chandeliers and music boxes. This was one of two he had bought in Florence with Venetian shades and Florentine fixtures. They were a very happily married couple with seven wonderful children and relatively few problems. But of course, there was that one. As always, when he was through dining, Asa would pull out Sarah's chair and say, what a wonderful dinner, my dear. And she would say, while you prepare the coffee in the parlor, I will light a cigar in the library. Sometimes I feel like I've worked all my life for this one enjoyment. Oh, I never told my wife that these cigars are a gift from the White House. No, oh, dear, I must join Sarah for coffee. I love my wife very much, but oh, <laughs> this cigar, well, I don't have to throw it away. I, it's very expensive. I'll just put it in my pocket. She'll never know. This nine-foot Steinway grand piano has a marvelous tone. Thank you, my dear. And now I shall select one of the six melodies on the music box. For Sarah, of course, I must play. Uh -huh. And now for my coffee in the Limoges China and a look around the room. It's called an icicle gasolier and has 855 pieces. I bought it the year I lost the governorship of Pennsylvania by 5,000 votes. I'm glad it worked out that way, um, that I got the chandelier. Oh, she's very upset. Wants me to pick up her fan. <laughs> of course I will. And now to bed. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. This upstairs landing fascinates Sarah. Perhaps it's because our children are here. Oh, Sarah must tuck in Mary, who is always uncovered. And I must play this roller orchestrian with snare drums, violins, and 186 pipes. Sixteen hundred dollars, Lord. <laughs> and now we'll go to our bedroom. <laughs> She's in such a jolly mood. But we already have seven children. At this hour, I think I'll take this call in the study. I don't want to disturb her. This chandelier is the most amazing of all. Eighty dollars for a Cornelius and Sons? <laughs> I wonder who could be calling. Oh, no. She wouldn't do that. I... What will I tell you this is? I can't believe it. I can't. Oh, oh she's still in the bathroom. Perhaps the cigar is still here. Maybe, maybe I'm just a little overly suspicious. I... Oh, she's so lovely tonight. <laughs> oh, but I must. Uh... Good night, dear. Oh yes. Good night. Thank you for coming. Don't forget your bag. That was lovely, Asa. I mean, Sammy. 
Yeah, I wish I had one of those cigars. In this 1937 Cadillac limousine that used to belong to the Al Capone family, we're going to take you to a very secret place. It's called Jack's Corner, and you're going to meet some people you've known about all your lives. Sammy? Elaine, I think we're going to see something very special. Jack's Corner is designed to bring you a series of unusual interviews, an opportunity to meet great men and women of the past who were controversial then and who left behind a legacy of myth and legend and unexplained activities that shocked and rocked a new nation that crawled and walked but had not yet learned to run. Also, over the next weeks, Jack's Corner will try to explain how and why these uh, seemingly irreverent meetings can take place. Today, we want you to meet the two great Americans who on July 11th, 1804, that's 186 years ago, were involved in one of the last duels fought on American soil. Soon after this fatal confrontation with pistols, dueling was forever outlawed in the United States. The duelists were Aaron Burr, Vice President of the United States under Thomas Jefferson, and Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of the Treasury under George Washington. The powers that are and who make everything else be have given us just a few minutes for this, we hope, enlightening interview. And for this, we thank them. To my immediate right is Mr. Aaron Burr, and uh, across from me, Mr. Alexander Hamilton. Uh, I think you may have guessed why we wanted to talk to you. The duel? The duel? Yes, the duel. We want to know why. Mr. Hamilton, I did not issue the challenge. I did. Yes, I know, but why was there a challenge and why was it accepted? Mr. Hamilton, it was known that especially since your 19-year-old son Philip had been killed in a duel three years earlier, you had an aversion to dueling. Yes, that is true. Then why did you accept the challenge? Why didn't you just ignore it? May I first ask if dueling is part of your society today? No, no, it is not. Um, it was banned shortly after your death. Ah, yes. Well, you see, it was quite different then. It was not considered illegal. Further, uh, honor was measured by courage and courage by honor. If I had declined to fight, my reputation as a gentleman would have been severely damaged. Yes, but you would have been alive. You would have spent many more years with your wife and family. Mr. Burr, why did you challenge a married man with seven children? I did not challenge a married man with seven children. I challenged a man who had maligned me on many occasions and who had uh, been most duplicitous on others. I challenged a man who made it perfectly clear to one and all that he did not like me and whom I had grown to despise. Incidentally, uh, I agree. Honor was at stake in uh, rejecting or accepting a duel then you too would have accepted. No question. Mr. Burr, would you please tell us one or some of the things that Mr. Hamilton did or said that drove you to uh, issue the challenge? Oh, Lord, there were so many, so many. When Jefferson and I tied for the presidency, I am sure that you are aware of that, are you not, that uh, we tied for the presidency? Yes, yes, of course, in the uh, 1800 election. Yes, 1800, yes. yes. Well, it was he who persuaded the House of Representatives to choose Jefferson. I then became vice president. I forgave him for that. But uh, then it was he who was also most responsible for my humiliating defeat in my campaign for the governorship of the state of New York. I worked hard for your opponent. Mr. Burr, because I thought he was far better qualified to be governor. And then he, it was in um, June of 1804, at a dinner party following the election, he told some friends who later told me that he held a 
a despicable opinion of me. His reason, his reason, <clears throat> I cannot tell it even now. I did not start the rumor, if that is what it was. I was merely one of the circulators. He said that I and my beloved daughter Theodosia were having, were having an affair. Mr. Hamilton, uh, it has been written that before the duel, you told your second that you would not shoot to kill, that you would fire into the air. Oh, I must hear this. I had no desire to kill Mr. Burr. Did you think that he would try to kill you? I wasn't sure, but yes, I thought so. Poppycock, if I may, if he fired into the air, it was merely to discredit my victory. With that one statement, he turned the rest of my life into a holocaust, a nightmare. After the death of Philip, I could never have killed anything. Tears, oh, tears for the horribly maligned Hamiltons. There is uh, one more question I would like to ask Mr. Burr. Please do not ask it. I've already apologized for doing so. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. For your uh, edification, the rumor was a malicious lie. That was for our edification. I was merely going to ask if this interview would change anything up there. Um, I'll see you next week. <laughs> hey, here comes the champ. Yep. I'm going to show you something, chump. I'm going to show you, look. I'm going to arrange these like this. All four, thrown at the same time. I'm going to make four ringers at the same time. Uh -huh. Elaine. Uh, Jack, before you do that, $5 says you cannot do that. I don't want your $5, Sonny. I will take... I'll shine your shoes with my hand. Right. How'd you like that, Elaine? Oh, he was so charming. Yeah. Absolutely black. Okay, honey. Watch. Here we go. <laughs> I want to see this. <sighs> oh! Jack, uh, give me the $5. They didn't land yet. <laughs> Come on. Let's check the landing. I don't oh, believe it. Let me get busy. Oh. <laughs> Elaine, who are we seeing next week? Martin Landau. And then we're going to the Gene Autry Museum and have a visit with Monty Hale. Remember him from all yeah. the old uh, westerns? Uh, he was fantastic. Let's say goodbye, huh? You missed it, Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.